Hello everyone and welcome to AWCI's webinar, Decoding Wall Type Schedules, Avoiding Ambiguity, Discerning Requirements, Consequences and Opportunities. My name is Tao Wen, AWCI's Education Program Manager. Uh, before we start, a few housekeeping items. Um, mics are muted. Please ask questions using the questions tab on your dashboard. Handouts are available on the handouts tab. At this time, I'd like to introduce our presenters, Don Allen and Daniel Static. Don is an internationally known expert in cold form steel design and currently serves as executive director of the Steel Framing Industry Association. His 30 plus years career in construction includes work for stud manufacturers, structural engineering firms, and association including AWCI, SSMA, and CFSEI. Our next presenter, Daniel Static, is Vice President at Salas O'Brien, a full service engineering and technical services firm serving CFS clients, architects, general contractors alike across North America and Canada. His experience ranges from engineering multi story load bearing CFS structures to detailing and coordinating prefabricated finish panels to modeling and coordinating interior BIM for hospitals for his clients as a single source experts. Um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Don. Don, take it away. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this AWCI webinar. Uh, thank you very much, Tao, and thank you, Daniel, for doing this webinar with us. Um, these are our learning objectives. Basically, this webinar is for both architects and specifiers who have to create these um, wall type schedules and for the contractors and estimators and bidders and installers that have to understand and interpret these. So we've, uh, as we go through, we're gonna talk about how you can identify and avoid ambiguity uh, for architects and specifiers, let them better understand how to create wall type schedules that can be easily interpreted and built correctly. Uh, again, for contractors, better discern requirements and architectural intent embedded in wall type schedules, strategies for dealing with unclear requirements, uh, understanding opportunities they may, that may present themselves in wall type schedules, and understand the risks and requirements for making the decision to use delegated design on interior partition. So let's start off with number one, identify and avoid design requirement ambiguity. So what are wall type schedules? They're typically a sheet in the drawings that give detailed information about how walls are constructed. On a floor plan, the walls are typically shown as just two lines with no additional details about how the wall is made, what wall requirements are for fire acoustic or structural. There's often a code in an oval or a diamond shape adjacent to the walls that's keyed to a partition type on the wall type schedule. So if you look across the bottom of these three images, you'll see P1 on the left, and then some variations on that, P1-S, P1-A, the center is P2, and then to the right is P3 with some variations as well. Um, so this th shows three details representing eight different wall types based on the notes below. Some of the items including the schedules include the stud depth, type, and spacing, gypsum or other finishes on one or both sides of the wall, UL design or fire rating, acoustical requirements, including sealant and insulation, special marking requirements for fire or smoke barriers, and then notes for bracing or connection to the structure above. So lots of stuff on these wall type schedules and it differs. The, there's not a specific template that all architects or architectural firms use. Sometimes if one company has multiple offices, they'll have their wall type schedules standardized across those offices, but there's not an AIA template that people follow for how they put these things together. So if a contractor is bidding a project or building a project, they kind of have to do a little bit of homework to figure out what is where and where these requirements are in these schedules. So you notice that they called out on this, the stud type is three and five eighths inch metal studs, four inch metal shaft wall studs, or three and five eighths inch studs. But really the nomenclature for studs is a good way to call this out. 
Most of you that are uh, framers are familiar with this. This is in both the SSMA and the SFIA catalogs. This one, this image is cut out of the SFIA catalog. But the important thing here is there's a little bit of information that's not on this. Things like the stiffening lip length are not on this. It's tied to the flange width. And also, you don't see any reference to gauge. The very last number gives material thickness, but the material thickness is written in mils. When specifying steel framing, it's best to use standard nomenclature and thickness requirements. Note that in all AISI, American Iron and Steel Institute, and SFIA, Steel Framing Industry Association documents, the thickness is expressed in mils or inches, not in gauges. And the question I often get is, why is that? Well, the reason is because there's not an industry standard thickness that matches the non-structural gauge thicknesses. So anything from 20 to 25 gauge has ambiguity. What an architect may consider 20 gauge may be very different from what a contractor considers 20 gauge. So how do you avoid this ambiguity? As recommended by the AISI and the Steel Framing Industry Association, use one of the following three options. Specify thickness using mils or de decimal inch values. Examples would be 33 mils or 0 .0 0 .0 0 0.0329 inches minimum thickness. Another option is specify thickness using performance criteria. An example would be L over 360 ma maximum deflection or maybe a deflection in combination with a pressure meets L over 240 with a 5 PSF out of plane live load pressure. And then a third option option is specify the members to be used with a standard designator that includes thickness as we saw in the previous slide. An example will be studs to be 362 S125-33 at 16 inches on center with a direct attached sheathing on both flanges, jams to be double 362 S125-33 on both sides of each opening up to six feet wide. Now what I just said was a specification for openings Daniel's going to talk a little bit more about this, and he has some opinions about how to specify the jams on openings for interior partitions. <clears throat> this is what you might see on a typical project. Um, just from looking at the drawings, the structural drawings, the elevations of the floors, the before the building is built, the contractor will see, okay, the distance to the underside of the deck is going to be 17 feet. Uh, the architect has shown based on the wall type, it's going to be three and five eighths inch studs. So you can't opt in automatically and say, well, I want to use four inch studs because that's going to work. Or I'm going to use six inch studs because that's going to work. We're pretty much constrained to three and five eighths inch studs if that's what's on the architectural drawings. And if you start trying to eat into the client's room space by going with thicker storage studs, there's a little bit of a problem. Uh, the architect also wants to achieve a sound transmission class, STC of 50 and it's got a meter to our fire rate. So where do you look for this information? One place is in one of the association technical guides, either SSMA or SFIA. Um, there are some values in ASTM C754, but basically this, these are free downloads, and I've given you the place where you can find the SFIA document online. <clears throat> when you open this up and look at the, the table of contents, you see this and say, all right, where am I going to find interior wall heights? Well, if you look at the, the bottom left next to the little green dot, that's the wall height tables, and there's a line for interior, non-structural, non-composite, and another line for interior, non-structural, composite. <coughs> so what is the difference between composite and non-composite? <laughs> this is composite, one layer, full height, both sides must go full height, must be attached to both flanges, and the board orientation and the fastening has to match what was tested by the manufacturer. So pretty detailed for composite. What about non-composite? Everything else. <laughs> okay, so by the way, if during the presentation you have some questions, type it into the chat, type it in the question box, either it will get answered back in the chat, back in the question box, or when we get to the poll questions, and yes, we do have a couple poll questions coming up, so pay attention, um, we'll have a minute for question and answer. Okay, so I mentioned that board orientation and fastening much ma must match what was tested by the manufacturer. 
quite often to qualify for composite, the board must be installed vertically. That's how most of the manufacturers test it. Also to meet fire rating requirements, joints may have to be staggered as you can see from this partially finished wall. <clears throat> so this image comes from what was the old Steel Framing Alliance, now it's the SFIA online fire and acoustical directory. And basically it references a bunch of designs, some of them are for the, from the Gypsum Association, some of them are from UL, some of them are from UL Canada, but it gives the basic information about the design and it gives a little plan detail in the upper right of what this design looks like. So you can see the C shape representing the studs, the squiggly lines representing the insulation, and then the dotted part between the horizontal lines representing the gypsum board. On the left, it's showing the one layer for one hour. Towards the right, you can see uh, four layers on each side for up to four hours. Now, I've, I've got this cut off. It wouldn't all fit on the slide, but this does go up to four hours for UL Design U419. Notice it has a little a black rectangle on the left that says EQ because it also includes EQ studs. And my question to you audience members, is this wall assembly composite or non-composite? So the clue is when you look at the plan in detail, you can see that the board is directly attached to both flanges. So as long as it goes all the way up to the top of the wall like this, and it's gonna have to because it's fire rated, then it's gonna be composite. So this is a composite wall. So let's look at Another condition, what if we create the same UL design, UL U419, they've got options in there, and we add sound isolation clips with flooring channel on one side of the wall. Is it still composite? Well, as soon as you put those sound isolation clips in there, you decouple one of the pieces of gypsum board from the flange of the stud. So, no, it's not composite, it is non-composite. Now, here's a totally different design, UL of design U452. Um, first bullets, the three and five eighths inch studs. It says 20 MSG because UL uh, hasn't gotten changed any of the stuff for, for gauge versus mill thickness, but 20 MSG is gonna be 33 mil. Um, it's got three inch thermofiber insulation, third bullet, two layers of half inch gypsum board on one side. And then the fourth bullet, steel resilient channels. And that is represented by the what looks like a little dashed line on the lower flange of the stuns of the diagram. So because that resilient channel is there and it decouples the bottom gypsum board from the flanges, this is also a non-composite assembly. So what if your board doesn't extend all the way up on both sides? That's kind of an easy one. It's non-composite. How do I brace the wall if the board doesn't go all the way up on both sides? Well, there's a special document for that. The Steel Stud Manufacturers Association, SSMA, has technical note TN02, unsheathed flange bracing. It was part of your handouts, so you can uh, download those by clicking on the handouts button here during the presentation, or you can go to the SSMA website, ssma.com slash technical library, or there's a link on their homepage of the technical library, and they've got about half a dozen technical notes on there, and this is one of them. It basically talks about the cold roll channel through the punch outs, which is one of the ways to brace a stud where you don't have board all the way up on both sides. So let's get back to our example. Here's where we were looking at the table. We know that there's both composite and non-composite. Uh, if you may recall from back at our example, the board does go all the way up on both sides because this is a fire rate of partition. So we're going to look for our answer in the interior non-structural composite, but first I'm gonna to go to page 17 and look at the interior non-structural non-composite to see how limiting heights compare. So here's non-composite. You can tell from the footnotes, which are at the top of the page here, that limiting heights are based on steel properties only. So we're not counting on the gypsum board to stiffen the flanges or to give us any added height, any boost of anything. It's just on the steel itself. So this, these is using the standard nomenclature. This is the, the name of the studs in the first column. Um, the parameters were 5 PSF, L over 240. So this is the column we're gonna look at in the table. We also need to know what the spacing is, and that's right next to the stud member. Notice that the table gives three different spacings for each type of member. And most of the contractors want to do it at 16 inches on center. But if you start going down this table, the first place that you see 17 feet, which is our wall height, 
is next to the 362 S12530 at 12 inches on center. Now, next to the 12 inches on center, you see a 33, and you think, oh, does that mean 33 mil? No, the FY is the yield strength, doesn't have anything to do with the mill thickness, but we really don't want to use this because we don't want to have to buy so many studs to space it 12 inches on center. So this is non-composite table. Let's look at composite and see what it tells us. So here's the same book, page 19, composite tables, interior non-structural composite. Um, the uh, member nomenclature here, 5 PSFL over 240, spacing is here. We could look down that 5 PSFL over 40 table go to the 16 inches on center, and we're not quite there, only at 16.7, we're not at 17 feet. So if we were gonna use the composite standard studs, we'd have to go to 33 mil, 362 S125-33. Well, let's see if we can do any better with EQ studs. There are no EQ studs listed in the SSMA or SFIA catalog, this just lists standard studs, so you have to go to the individual manufacturer. So this is a proprietary EQ stud. I pulled this out of a manufacturer's table. This is their stud nomenclature. Instead of an S125, it says PS125. This is the 5 PSFL over 240. This is the spacing. And if we look at 16 inches on center, it will go to 1610. Now, a lot of people, uh, engineers and whatnot, will probably say, this is probably good enough. What's gonna happen is it's not gonna fail for flexural or or web crippling because you can see when you go over to L120, this same stud will go up to 20 feet six, just to the left of the oval. But 1610 is as far as it goes. Well, again, this is just one manufacturer's proprietary stud. Let's look at another manufacturer's table. Looks a little bit different. Still has the same uh, columns, member designation, L240 under the five PSF spacing. And if we want to go 17 feet, look at this. We're 17.6 at 16 inches on center with an EQ stud. So just the point I'm making here is, is not all studs are equal. For those that are specifying studs in their wall type schedule, you've gotta be, be aware that you're not sure which one of these EQ studs are gonna be out there if you permit somebody to use EQ studs. And most of the studs in the market today are EQ studs. They've been thoroughly tested, they've been vetted. Uh, a lot of them go through our code compliance program at SFIA. So there's no reason not to. It's just be aware of what the performance are, are for these so that they meet what you want. All right, time for everybody to wake up for the poll question. If walls are fully sheathed, full height, why add CRC in the punch outs? Four options are A, prevent stud rotation, B, prevent stud lateral translation, C, prevent both rotation and lateral translation, and D, satisfies the architect and or building inspector. Just let me clarify that I did not, uh, th this is not a question about something we've already taught you in the presentation. This is just to get your opinion and see what people think about this, and then I'll tell you what my opinion is on this. Um, so 16% says provides additional bracing for the studs. 10% prevents stud rotation, 3% prevents stud lateral translation, 61% prevents both rotation and lateral translation, and 10% satisfy the architect and or building inspector. All right, well, 10% win or at least agree with me, satisfy the architect and or building inspector. So the, the, the situation is if you've got wall sheathing all the way up on both sides that does a much better job of preventing those flanges from twisting or rotating or moving laterally than anything that you could put in the punch outs especially with the fairly thin studs that are out there on the market today for non-structural and again this is for interior that um, if you just put coal roll th channel through the punch outs, which I've seen written in specifications, and I've seen some people do, they just lay it in there, it's not gonna provide any restraint. If you clip it off, then yes, it will provide some restraint, but it really doesn't do anything. But a lot of times you'll see a line in the specifications or on the wall type schedule that tells you that you have to put it in there. Well, if you've got sheathing all the way up on both sides, don't have to worry about clipping it off, don't have to worry about making any attachments, that's, it's, that's all done by the gypsum board on the outside. Um, I have heard some arguments that if you are in a uh, 
structural condition, then yes, it does make a difference. And you have, have to put stuff in there typically based on the requirements of AISIS 240, but that's a whole different ball game and that's beyond the scope of what we're talking about today. All right, so we're moving on to our next two learning objectives, which are architects and specifiers will be able to better understand how to create wall type schedules that can be easily and correctly interpreted and better discern requirements and architectural intent embedded in wall type sketches and details. So Daniel, over to you. All right, thanks, Don. All right, there, yeah, scrub this. So first, uh, we're gonna look at an example where the architect provides uh, span and thickness information on their partition sheet. So here we've got uh, two partition types in the project. And uh, the only difference is uh, the one on the top is uh, sheath full height and the one below is sheet six inches above the ceiling. And if you notice on the highlighted area for the max height versus the thickness, uh, they're identical. Um, so why might this be? Um, I think uh, the obvious answer to me is uh, the architects do try and standardize these tables uh, to be quickly used and work for multiple conditions. So, you know, they're not in the, in the business of maximizing economy for every single condition. So I think it'd be pretty normal to see these two tables be identical, even though um, they're a little bit different as far as uh, what you need for the pressures based on where it's sheathed. So what does this mean? It means that uh, there's a high probability that uh, a lot of these can be conservative, uh, especially for the lower condition. Um, but on the other hand, um, they can always be unconservative if the architect is, is misunderstanding uh, composite versus non-composite uh, in what they show. Let's go to the next here. So, <clears throat> wall height and sheathing. So we took this limiting height table and we compared it to various design conditions for these members to try and see what this architect assumed. So did they assume that it was braced at four feet? Did they assume it was sheathed full height? Uh, what flange length did they assume? Uh, maybe uh, they assumed the minimum that was uh, listed in the spec. Um, but so we went through and we made some runs and we're gonna blow up that table to see what we've got. So on the left, we've got fully braced. Then we've got CRC at four. The highlighted yellow is what the architect has. And then on the far right is, is the difference between braced at four and what the architect is showing. Um, so what do we see here? Well, um, they're all quite different. They're a little conservative and it's, it's unclear what assumption they're making to get those span values. Um, you know, does the architect intend to provide stiffer walls for the client? Um, do they believe the conservatism will save them money in the long run uh, for potential underperformance or misinstallations? We're not sure. Um, so why does the wall sheathing and bracing conditions matter? So here's the same wall, same height, uh, same performance criteria. So I, we ran this five PSF L over 240. And on the far left, it's sheathed full height. Uh, the center, it's sheathed to just above the ceiling. And on the right, um, it, it terminates above the ceiling with the kicker. And above each of these are the studs we can use to meet that five PSF L over 240 based off of the span and braced conditions. So you can see that uh, it gets lighter and lighter as you go to the right. Um, so on the far left, you know, it, it's fully braced. We ran this as fully braced. We didn't run it as composite. Um, and then for the center, um, there's only that five PSF where it's sheathed. And above that, um, there, that loading doesn't occur. That's the difference. It still has the full span. And then on the far right, uh, it's only spanning up to the brace. So it's a much shorter span. That's why it can be a lot lighter. Um, so this shows that a framing span table used for all three conditions, um, if it gives these uh, minimum gauges for the span conditions, 
um, it would theoretically use limits for the worst case and potentially create unnecessary requirements for the rest. So if an architect, um, if they've got span limitations and gauges and they show uh, the same limit for all three of these conditions, you can, you can, you know, you can think that, well, it's hopefully it's correct for the far left, but all of these other conditions on the right, um, these right two conditions, potentially oversized, you know, maybe there's, um, maybe there's some opportunity there. Um, so, you know, the contractor might not be able to properly size all these conditions. Um, I'm not sure if there are any pre-made tables from the manufacturers for the center condition, because um, I would speculate that there's too many variables. Uh, you've got a floor height, you've got a deck height, you've got a sheathing height, um, and you've got bracing conditions related to those. Uh, so the tables, you know, uh, they would get pretty large. Um, maybe someone can correct me if there are some pre-made tables for those, but what, what does that do? It makes it so the contractor can't take this center condition um, and easily um, size it themselves. Uh, so what do we take from this? You know, maybe something to think about. Uh, on smaller projects, maybe this doesn't matter. Maybe the spans are so short, um, it, it, it's negligible, right? It doesn't matter. Um, but larger projects, really, you know, large deck heights, multiple conditions. Um, maybe think about, you know, if you actually break these up and economize this framing, um, get your engineer involved, there could be some material savings. All right. So let's talk about specific risk when performing wall takeoffs. Um, we wanted to point out talking about partial height walls. Now, usually architects will um, identify partial height walls in their tags um, with some sort of uh, nomenclature, A, B, C, D, something like that. Um, so if you look on the screen here, you know, here's a snip from a plan that identifies partitions. Just from looking at this, uh, uh, this screen, there's no way you can tell what, which walls are partial height. You know, you just, you can't tell. And even if uh, the architect marks which walls are partial height, um, there is risk of missing it and, miss, and, and not understanding if one's full height or one's partial height. So, uh, you know, why can this be a risk to the contractor? Um, you know, as we saw in the previous slide, you know, partial height walls come with a bunch of different framing requirements and, you know, usually the architect doesn't have the capacity to pre-plan which one of these requirements um, are going to need to be used so let's keep talking about this so here's the same project and here are the partition types from the schedule on the left um, they're shown as partial height with a nice little baby kicker about two feet up and on the right is the actual condition um, these partial height walls actually are 19 feet below the roof. So if you do the math on a 45 degree kicker, I think that's somewhere in the 27 foot range. And I think we all can agree that that's not very practical for a kicker. All right, so let's talk about some options. So, so you know, we talked about identifying these partial height walls, knowing when uh, knowing where these are. It's really important to identify these. So some of these options are, we got five options. Looks like we're going to list them here one by one, but on the right, we kind of have, I think we have most of them represented. So what do we do? We can use a ceiling diaphragm, but that does require a joisted ceiling or a CFS screen ceiling with chip. I uh, can't have ACT for that. Maybe you can tie it to an adjacent full height wall um you can kick it to the roof but you know in some cases that's not practical like we just saw you can use posts at a nominal spacing that's on kind of the top left of that this diagram um sometimes that's kind of it, sometimes that's the only practical option depending on the height of the roof and then number five is it can be integrated with the rest of these as using the top track or a stud um, as a girt along the top of the wall to get um, to uh, these support members that uh, are mentioned above that. 
Um, so we're not going to go into these in detail, but you know, we want to point out that it's important when we're looking at these partition sheets, they don't identify this stuff for you. And it's really important for the contract to understand, you know, there are implications in framing and supporting these walls that might not be clearly shown. They might be technically shown, um, but it doesn't mean it's perfectly clear. And Danny, just, just let me add something to that. One of your options, your last option was to use a top of wall girt. I had a condition, it was a three and five eighths inch wall, went up and stopped and we had a long run and basically I had to take a 12 inch deep member, lay it flat across the top of the wall and use it to span from one adjacent wall to another. I think it was like 25 feet. So it was a, a, just an odd condition, but the deck was so high they didn't have any options of going up to the deck or any perpendicular wall. So it's, it's not an easy condition. Right. Right. And the hard part is when, is, is when you're planning out what to do, the, some of these, the, you know, the wall layouts um, on these projects, you think when you're planning, oh, we can just do this and it works everywhere. And you end up with all five options in different places. Exactly. And it's really hard to determine what to do without the help of someone who does it all the time. All right. All right, let's quickly talk about performance criteria. Uh, we we want to point out, um, you know, most of the time what I see is 5 PSFL over 240 as a standard. I need to say quickly that I, I do see L over 120 in spec sometimes, but not very often. Um, it's, it's rare for me to see L over 120. But here's the typical, and here are some uh, some conditions where uh, where that's not enough. Um, so number one is tiled walls. Um, almost always, you know, I always see L over 360 being needed. Um, an important reference, the first time I heard of this reference, I think was a year or two ago, and I, I'm sure there's some people that have known it for longer, um, but it's from the Tile Council of North America, uh, the SNP below here. Um, thanks to Don for looking that up for me. Um, but it requires 33 mil main and G60. So um, be careful on tiled walls. Um, if the architect's uh, uh, partition sheet gives you gauges and spans for all these wall types, and but they don't mention, but it's in the plan notes or in the notes that you need to do this for tiled walls, it's something, you know, there's risk of missing this or there's risk of misidentifying where this is required. And the same goes for these other options. Masonry or brittle finishes might be L over 360, 720 or 1000 for maybe some like thin natural stone, uh, mechanical or shaft areas. Um, uh, you know, uh, they're going to need uh, 10 to 15 PSF depending on the situation. And entr entrance vestibules um, sometimes will require 10 PSF, um, just uh, being open to the exterior there. And, and one comment on this, on the, the shaft areas, um, if you've got multiple high-speed elevators, they, they've shown that those the, the speed of those elevators in those shafts can create up to those 15 PSF pressures. So that, that's something to be aware of for interior shaft walls. Right, and you know, we, we know the design team will specify where it's required or should, um, but sometimes everything's in, you know, three different places, um, and, and it's up to us to try and put that together. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So let's move on to the next. So Don, I'm going to hand it back over to you here. All right. So yeah, develop strategies for dealing with unclear requirements and conflicting information. And we're going to call that understanding possible opportunities. So let's see what op opportunities are out there for us. So what do contractors do? when the specified design does not work for their condition? Well, you can request more information, basically put out an RFI and say, is there a proposed solution or can we use tighter spacing, thicker studs, and get paid for the added expense? Because by going with thicker studs or by going with something that's beyond what has been uh, specified, you wanna get paid for that because that, that's an ad compared to what, what should have been uh, what was bid. If not, can we go with deeper studs? In other words, as I was saying earlier, the architect doesn't like you eating into their floor space, but sometimes just adding another few eighths of an inch, going from a three and five eighths inch stud to a six, uh, four inch stud, 
um, can really help you cut down the thickness of the stud or the spacing. Um, another thing to do is change the parameters, and, and Daniel uh, hinted at this. He said, if something is specified as 10 PSF, is it really necessary? And again, unless it's something like those high-speed elevators or pressurized air plenum or something that, that maybe has exterior air coming in and out, and, and we're primarily talking about interior partitions here, but some of those conditions, you can be at 5 PSF and the performance is going to be fine across the lifetime of the building in most cases. Um, if L over 360 is specified, is it really quiet, required? If it doesn't have a brittle finish on it, it's just painted walls, gypsum board walls, a lot of times you can go to L over 240. And as uh, Daniel said, in some cases, he's seen L over 120 in the specifications. Um, Something you can do, and I worked for a stud manufacturer for two different stud manufacturers for many years, and part of my job as the technical representative was answering calls from clients and customers. One of the first thing I always ask, is it built yet? And if they've already built these things, which they usually have, how do I get this to work? And there are various scenarios we'll talk about that you can do that. Um, sometimes I'd write a letter saying it's okay. So if they needed a 17 foot span and my table said it, it would go up to 16, uh, 10, so just two inches left. I'd say, well, by looking at the tracks and some other things that, that can help you out, then I might write a letter saying that that's okay. Um, sometimes you can get them to provide an engineering judgment. An engineer can, can run a span and say, all right, this will work, or you put this on it or put this board on it, it's gonna help. And then another option you can use is kickers. And I'm gonna talk a lot about kickers because that seems to be a lot of people, including architects and specifiers, think kickers are the silver bullet, and this is going to make your wall perform or be able to go higher, but there's a lot of stuff to kickers. So this brings up our sec second poll question. Uh, I call kickers a solution with their own set of problems. Poll question number two, how do you detail kickers to full height studs with a slip connection? The options are, one, slip at stud top, fixed kicker, two, slip at stud top and slip at the kicker, three, slip at the stud to kicker connection, and four, there is no effective kicker slip detail. So Tao, do we have any questions? And uh, Daniel, do you have any, any comments you wanna add? Yeah, there's a there are a couple of questions here. You talking about kickers here. Do you need slip track when using kickers? And and the well, <laughs> that would kind of give away the answer. But uh, if it's specified that you have to use slip track at the top of a stud and it shows a kicker, there are some problems. But uh, my my response is no, because kickers with slip don't doesn't work. <laughs> I'll show well, you why yeah. over the next few slides. And let's differentiate between a full height wall to deck with the kicker versus a partial height wall with the kicker as well. Yes. Yeah. Of course, a partial height wall, um, the the top track is going to be down away from the deck, away from the structure. And so that, that top track is just going to tie the studs together. That's all it's doing. It, it doesn't need to slip when it's down low. Well, there's one condition where it does, it does, and that's one of the details that Danny showed a little while ago, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And what's our other question, Tao? Well, I'm going to share the results, and then we'll come back to okay. other questions. So the results, um, slip at stud stop, fixed kicker, 12%, slip at sub stud top, slip at kicker, 12%, slip at kicker to stud connection, 10%. And the winner, 66%, there's no effective kicker slip detail. And that is good because that is my answer as well. I think I kind of tipped my hand on that one. But yes, as, as soon as you start getting vertical movement and, and have a diagonal kicker in there, it causes some problems. So, so we're ready for the next question. Um, where should vertical deflection occur? Um, I'm not sure if that's specific to kickers or not, but well, if, if you... All these, um, the next couple of questions came when uh, Daniel was presenting slide 33 with okay. wall height and sheathing. All right, there's 33. So, so and, and Daniel, I'll let you answer that question. Where should the slip track be? Sure, sure. Uh, on the On the 
uh, left two conditions, if they're not bearing walls, um, actually the middle one can't be a bearing wall, uh, but uh, it would be at the top of the wall. It's to isolate the, the structure's live load vertical deflection from the wall if it's supported on the level below. And on the right, um, we just talked about that a little bit and, and Don's gonna get into detail on how, the, how it works with the kicker. Yeah, but on the one on the right, no need for a slip track anywhere. Right. Okay. And um, this one also goes with this slide is that in center condition, where is CRC required or not? Yeah, so the center condition, re we ran uh, braced at four above the sheathing. Um, so where it's sheathed, you can consider it fully braced. Above there, we ran it with uh, bracing at four. So you would need CRC at four above the sheathing. And and that, that is addressed by the SSMA tech note that I referred to, I don't remember what slide it was on, but it was towards the beginning of the presentation. There is an SSMA tech note that that calls that out. If you go to ssma.com, click on technical library, scroll down to the technical notes and it's TN02. All right. And then uh, could you tie in a non-STC rated partial height wall into a full height STC rated wall? I, I think I missed it. Could you tie in? Yeah. Um, rate, rated tie in to not rated? Yes, a tie in a non STC rated to a full height STC rated. Oh, okay. I I think, and Daniel, you correct me. I, I think they're talking about like a T intersection. So you have one wall running along, and then you have another wall coming perpendicular to it. And uh, I, I guess the question is, can you use that full height wall to brace or or um, the 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 shorter wall? And my answer would be yes, but when you do the tying in, you can't cut out the gypsum board or, or otherwise compromise. I would just put what is called a slammer stud up against the gypsum board. Um, if it lines up with a stud, which it should, you should place a stud in there for it to line up with. You can screw through that gypsum board, say two feet on center and a few places along that, and then use that to connect the wall that's come, the short wall that's coming out of it. Daniel, is that how you see it? Yeah, and, and a lot of architects are pretty particular about in wall intersections for rated and non-rated, and they show how they want it because they want to continue the whatever rating they're trying to get. Uh, so a lot of them will have plan diagrams for that intersection. And a lot of a lot of the specifications will call out a three stud corner. Um, they'll have details, as you said, and ASTM C754 gives some corner details. So. There's a couple of places you can go to that. And also the manufacturers have some of those. Okay, the next question is um, for slide 37. Um, this Brian says, on the last few projects, I have seen at stone tile walls calling for a L-720. Yet in the span tables, this is not called out. Right, and it's it's, kind of an overarching topic we're talking about is it's uh, uh, contradictions in the contract documents or things that don't quite match up and things that we try and we're, you know we all want to identify uh, to be able to handle them properly um, on and the particular case mentioned you know I think we all understand that the 720 is probably correct and um, just because it's not called out in that other location doesn't mean it's not necessarily required and a lot, of, a lot of times you may need the, the manufacturers, the tile manufacturers will tell you um, the substrate needs to meet L over 360, L over 720, whatever. I know the Brick Industry Association has a steel stud brick veneer design guide or a design paper free download on their site. But again, brick is typically exterior, so, so not, not uh, of concern for interiors. But uh, American Iron and Steel Institute, AISI, came out, out with a steel stud brick veneer design guide, and both of those documents require L over 600 for brick. So something that, that if somebody does specify 720 or 1,000 for brick, you can use one of those or both of those documents to say, hey, guys, all we need to have is L over 600. Um, so this is just a comment that Mike, in response to what you said earlier, 
that wall intersection details only works if there's no sound isolation on the side of the STC rated wall that you're tying into. <laughs> all right, thank you, Mike. No, I appreciate that because if you did, as I was saying, and you put those screws all the way through into a stud, you would be short circuiting that sound isolation. So good comment, good question. All right, so we're gonna move back to slide 41 and talk about kickers. What happens to this wall when the roof moves? Well, the roof moves up and down, the kicker's at 45 degrees, and you can probably guess this wall, at least the top of it, is gonna move left to right. So again, this is uh, really, there's no place to put a slip condition in here, so you don't have slip connectors, and, and really, the movement most of the time isn't gonna be that much unless you're going underneath a roof with high snow loads. So in Florida, you may not have to worry about this too much. Yes, you get a little bit of roof uplift during a high windstorm or a hurricane, but not nearly as much as the long-term deflection you get with snow. So this wall would move from side to side. You may have some crushing of your ceiling tiles or distress around the perimeter of the wall uh, in the, at the ceiling adjacent to this. So what about this condition? You've got movement down across the whole roof and you're pushing on this kicker. What's gonna happen? Well, there's the roof moving down. This is the system moving over. So you start to buckle that stud and that kicker doesn't help you. As a matter of fact, it's pushing even harder on that stud trying to get it buckle over. So not a good condition if you don't have a slip here. Well, here's an architectural detail. Matter of fact, it's one of the ones we showed earlier in this presentation where somebody tries to handle that. They show vertical bracing slash bridging at 48 inches on center max. Now, bracing typically goes horizontal through the stud. I looked at where the arrow is pointing and it's pointing at the air between the studs or maybe it's pointing at the studs. So maybe they, they're saying that the stud goes all the way up to the upper roof at every four feet. I'm not sure what they mean by vertical bracing. But what I think is going on here is they're showing this track for the low stud. They're showing extending framing to underside of structure where it's indicated on plans. But then there's an alternative method in lieu of studs full height to deck, put diagonal bracing at 48 inches on center. And you can see the two dashed lines for the diagonal bracing and the note at the upper left that says brace to structure. So if we look at this, this is kind of what it's showing. If you use that note at the upper right that says alternative method. Well, my feeling is that the alternative method, bracing at 48 inches on center, is not a good option because if you had these alternating left and right and you had deflection of the ceiling, those kickers would push from one side and then the other, so your plan detail of the wall would look like this. So again, not a good option when you've got the roof moving or the upper level moving and kickers in this orientation. So I'm gonna put a circle and a line through that art alternative method. It's much better running the stud all the way up to the underside of the roof. And here's another detail, again, one that Daniel showed earlier today, that shows a novel way to do this. There's the roof deck, there's the brace to the, the structure, but they show this metal runner slip track down at the bottom of the kickers, or as uh, Daniel was saying, the baby kickers. And so that slip track is independent of the deck and conceivably you could have the slip track down low. My question to whoever drew this is how in the heck is somebody gonna build this? Because look at this shape. I've never seen a stud made to that shape. I've seen people cut them to that shape, but getting it to, to keep it where that top slip track would not rotate when there's pressure against the wall is a difficult thing to do. It can be done, but really a difficult way to do it. So again, not a good answer for how you would handle kickers in this configuration. So Don, you've told us all these things we can't do. We've got all these problems. How do you do it? How do you handle tall walls that won't work without kickers and they're trying to put slip in? One is find a non-kicker solution. And as you can see in this picture, somebody has some really long studs going up in this warehouse. You see they've got a gal on a lift. They've got a crane lifting the end of it. These are, I think, 12 inch deep with two and a half or three inch flanges on it. So some pretty hefty studs because as you see, it's sagging in the middle as they're lifting it up. If you've got a really thin stud, it's gonna buckle. So you gotta be careful of that. 
You can also use tighter stud spacing. You can use thicker studs, as is the case in this one. You can use double studs or heavier studs or deeper studs, four inch, six inch, eight inch, as is shown in this picture, a 12 inch stud. So these are some of the non-kicker solutions. And then a novel innovation solution is vertical trusses. And I can hear you guys, come on, Don, nobody's gonna build vertical trusses to span long distances. Well, you've got something like this warehouse in this picture. This is exactly what they did. You can see in the picture on the left, they've got these tables set up on wood sawhorses for some reason, uh, where they're assembling all these pieces that are in the floor. They're putting cross braces in here. It looks like a chase wall, but it, it is designed to be like a, vent, a, a truss so that you get the truss action of the moment connections of the horizontal pieces. And then you can see in the picture on the right, they're using the crane to lift it into place. Some very tall walls here. You can see the size of that guy down at the bottom. And I think that some of them were more than 80 feet tall. Uh, this was a submittal to the SFIA um, construction award. So uh, in a way, innovative ways to do it. It's just not an easy solution. And when people are bidding on this, they've got to make sure that they take all the, the labor into account that it takes to make something like this. Now, over the years, I've been doing this for a while, I've seen some very interesting kicker details. This was a fax that I got way back in 2009. You look towards the center of your screen up at the top, it says 7-6-2009-1451. And this guy had drawn this kicker and he's got a note, orient kicker with a web vertical to maximize structural properties. Um, he shows two, two different ways to attach it to the beam a shoe type connection, which I don't know what that is. I know, know what stud shoes are for window sills and windows heads, never seen it on a beam connection. And then it says, attach web of the kicker stud to the web of the framing stud, notch and patch the gypsum board as required. So uh, the other thing they do is they put what I call a strong back. At framing without gypsum board to the kicker level at a horizontal member, same as the studs, just below the kickers to tie together all the studs. And this is how they they uh, uh, justify supporting the studs that are in between the ones at the kickers at four feet on center. <clears throat> this is a more recent one. Um, both of the detail on the, on the left and the right are the same. Uh, these are from a wall type schedule. The one on the left is type B9 and B10. The one on the right is type B11 and B12. Um, in your handouts, you can't see the picture on the left because I've got this little drawing over it that shows this is what's gonna happen if you follow the instructions in the green, which is three and uh, five eighths inch metal stud kicker at 48 inches on center alternating, you're gonna get this serpentine path that I had discussed earlier. And again, this connect situation will not work well with slip connectors unless you're running that stud all the way up to the roof. So as soon as you use the kickers, it becomes problematic. It says extend and clip every third stud to the structure above. So that might help you a little bit. So that those are the ones that have the kickers on it. There's every third stud. And then this is the condition that you're gonna get if you do run the kicker all the way up to the top is the deflection will cause this thing to buckle and you don't have a good situation. Um, I, I thought this was a novel detail. This is someone showing, well, we've already built the wall. We've already put the sheathing up on both sides. It may have fire properties, may have acoustical properties, but the structural properties aren't good enough. They tried to put a kicker in here and they ran this fancy track with this strange angle on it. And obviously it's not gonna be four inches deep because they're cutting that four inch stud at an angle. It's gonna be longer. So what you have to do is um, instead of putting the track here, you put a clip angle, screw the clip angle to the wall and have the other part attached to the kicker. But again, don't try to accommodate deflection. That was a real project that I worked on and the kickers ended up being really long. For example, the wall brace point is eight feet, six inches below the roof, kickers at 45 degree angle. You calculate how long are those kickers gonna be? And by the way, the angle isn't always gonna be 45 degrees because you have to go up and tie into something structural. Typically you can't just go to the roof deck because it's very flexible. So they had to go all the way over to this bar joist, put some vertical clip angles in there. If you look closely, that's how it's tied off to those clips. But to calculate the length of that kicker, you take the eight and a half feet below the deck where the kicker is tied into it. If, if it is at 45 degrees, you divide this by the cosine of 45 and you come up with a 12 foot long kicker. If it's gonna take any degree of axial load, it's probably gonna to have to have some sort of weak axis bracing in there because they have very little capacity. 
All right. We're down to learning objective five. Daniel, I'll turn it back over to you. All right, thanks. <clears throat> Let me go back and read it. <laughs> okay, understand the risks and requirements for making the decision to use delegated design on interior partitions. So this is gonna include uh, what I do is uh, when is structural engineering required um, and you know how to handle some of these things because we've just presented a lot of problems. Uh, so we've made uh, a little table here um, to help um, someone uh, brainstorm or understand potential risks um, and weigh it with 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 what decision they're going to make if they're bidding or if they're or if they're making their partition schedule. Um, and I don't want to read through all of them, uh, but on the left we have you know what what would most of us think is the minimum required? What, what does this partition sheet need to show? Uh, in the middle, um, maybe not always required, but helpful and uh, if shown correctly, um, you know, might be required sometimes and would be great to have. On the right, um, these are all items, uh, high probability of, of, of misrepresenting or showing incorrectly, uh, which can introduce risk. Um, for uh, all parties involved. Um, so one question, uh, you know, on the left here, I didn't say, um, you know, I did say, is there a minimum step thickness required? You know, we're saying, you know, in our opinion, you know, it's best to provide performance criteria and let the contractor meet that criteria. Um, but, um, you know, architects often, they do still have minimum stud thickness requirements for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, why do I need a 33 mil here when I can get a lighter EQ stud to meet the overall performance criteria? Um, and, you know, I interviewed one of our architects before this and asked various questions um, to try and help me get some perspective um, on this particular thing. And uh, one of their answers for this question, actually, uh, it was great. I agree with it. He said, you know, he wanted to be sure that certain hung items from the wall have proper backing. And, you know, just because a stud member meets the performance criteria of the, the wall pressure and the deflection, it doesn't mean that things that are hung on the wall um, are gonna work well with that lighter stud. Um, so that was what he was worried about when he uh, specifies a minimum uh, stud gauge for certain, uh, certain conditions when it might otherwise be able to be lighter. Um, but anyway, all the information here can be pretty helpful. Um, on the right, for the uh, for the riskier things, it's mainly specify. It's mainly the architect specifying things that involve potential design, um, because the risk of it being incorrect is just a lot higher, um, in, including specific bracing info, um, specific sizing, and specific thicknesses that aren't necessarily minimums um, based on some other criteria. Um, ambiguous engineering language, um, like saying engineering is only required if it's if the studs are beyond span table limits. Um, that can be considered a little ambiguous. How does the contractor um, decide what, what they need engineering for? Um, um, so, Let's see. I think that's all I want to say about this slide. I don't want to go on too long for on this slide. So um, ignored opportunity can become risk. So what do I mean? So I, I, you know, I'm using the word opportunity for anything um, that could be a, a gray area, uh, a small mistake, something not shown. Uh, it could be potential opportunity um, for a contractor to gain an edge. Um, but it can be added risk for everyone involved when it's ignored. Um, so, you know, when, when, when are we creating risks? Making assumptions, not sending in the RFI, not communicating uh, what we're thinking. Um, blindly following listed requirements. Not recognizing intent versus mistake versus ignorance. And sometimes this is one of the uh, difficult thing uh, <laughs> to discern. Um, so here's an example of potential intent. Walls with blocking shall be 33 mil min. Um, 
you know, that might be intentional from the architect, like I previously said, they know what they know a bunch of things are hung from these walls and they want 33 mil man. That might not be a mistake. Maybe this next one is a mistake. Um, there's a wall shown bordering a protected area, it, any sort of protection, and, and it's shown as partial height and it just rings as incorrect. That might be a mistake. Uh, you know, they might they might have meant to mark that as a full height wall. Um, and then ignorance, you know, specifying some sort of engineering requirement um, uh, that might not be actually required. All jams shall be 43 mil um, and braced it for regardless of any of the conditions. It just shall be that way. Um, you know, that's uh, it, it. It leaves a lot of uh, a lot of things on the table there. So. You know, it's not my place to talk about how you handle all these. It, it, it's best to to try and understand that they're there, and then that way you can handle them um, as, as soon as you can and, and um, take a stance on what you need to. So now what? Um, how can we manage inconsistent requirements, mistakes, and risk in this area? The best uh, we have right now, uh, you, you need an educated and experienced team. Uh, it's, it's, it's the best defense. Sometimes that includes your engineer. Uh, I mean, a lot of the things we talked about today can include your engineer. Um, and then, you know, it depends on what kind of projects you're working on, obviously. Um, and interpretations of the requirements and understanding the intent versus mistake versus ignorance relationship, because um, a lot of things on the drawings are inconsistent, maybe not shown. And uh, they do usually fall into one of these three categories, um, and it does take experience and an educated team to be able to, to sift through these properly. Um, so I talked a little bit about a strategy and risk and noticing these things, but I also must mention to differentiate strategic risks that you're taking versus safety risks. Um, you know, be mindful of life safety items. There's a lot of things that might not be shown on the partition sheet or might, might conflict that we know could potentially be life safety items and they need to be addressed. Horizontal shaft anchorage, you're, you're hanging these really heavy shafts from the deck. That's a life safety thing. It, you know, they do need to be engineered, but it's, you know, where does it say that? It, it does say it. It says it in the spec. It says it in the manufacturer's guides, but it's not in front of your face. And an in, inexperienced person might look, look might look past that, and then all of a sudden, now you need to hire an engineer when you didn't have that. You weren't, you know, predicting that. And um, all right, I'll move on to the next one. Heavy cladding on large spans, and then rails and barriers. So, you know, when it, engineering risk, some architects. Um, they're trying, they do want to pass this along. I think that's fair. They want to pass the engineering risk along, but, um, let me move on there, but, you know, passing engineering risk to the contractor right now, the industry, it, it's working on properly balancing and identifying that requirement on a per project basis. So it's kind of all over the place and it's creating a lot of, a lot of heartburn. Um, Everyone should have the same goal, and I think they do. Um, we want to identify what should be engineered and only engineer that. That's I think that's everyone's goal. Um, and trying to identify it early and get everyone on the same page, um, I think that lowers the risk um, in the long run of the project for everyone involved. Um, you know, let's leave the typical prescriptive framing conditions to be framed as they've been proven to perform. And I'm sorry if I rushed through that. I know we're running late on time, so I was trying to trying to get through those. And then now we are on the last slide. This is the learning objectives we went through. Hopefully, uh, we satisfied these objectives uh, in enough detail. Um, Don, I'm going to hand it off to you. If you have any last uh, words, I want to before I want to thank you, Don, for having me on. Oh, well, uh, thank you for the information and sorry if I took too long and didn't leave you enough time for your last few slides. So this concludes the AIA continuing education course, but Daniel and I are going to stay on and answer questions. And if you have more questions for us that maybe we didn't get to today or might involve a detail or, so, or something, our contact information, including our email addresses, are up on the, the screen. 
If you need any of the resources from uh, the Steel Framing Industry Association, SFIA, our URL is on the lower right, just above the page number, uh, www.steelframing.org. And Tao, back to you for any questions we might have. All right, there are a couple more here. Um, do you happen to know why the TCNA recommends minimum 20 GA studs? I'm assuming GA stands for gauge, and sorry, Don, about using gauge. <laughs> Matt. So the um, the technical director of SFIA, uh, Pat Ford, as well as the technical director of the uh, Gypsum Association, Michael Smida, sat on the committee and lobbied to to try to get that taken out to make it so it, it was performance just where somebody could call for Elever 360 or higher. But uh, T TCNA voted them down and they wanted it in there. And and the reason I think, and again. This is my opinion, is because they are a brittle finish. Um, there are some very large, large format tiles out there now, uh, but I think the primary reason is the anchorage of the fasteners. They wanted to make sure that the fasteners um, performed well where they were going into stu the studs, so that uh, even though that we've done some independent testing that shows even for the EQ studs and the much thinner studs down to 15 mil. That, the, that anchorage when done at the right speed screw gun with the right pitch of threads, of screw threads, can be done properly. But that that was the concern, from my understanding, I was not at those meetings, but those, those were the concerns of TCNA. Okay, next question. Have you seen slip track on shaft wall? Yes. And it's uh, typically they recommend the J runner, but there's a lot of head of wall details out there for shaft wall. Just remember, shaft wall is almost always rated, and that top slip, slip connection needs to be, uh, may need to be one of the specific head of wall details that, that go with it, or um, it may need to be filled with uh, some sort of fired acoustical sealant. Um, That's just above the one inch liner panel. Okay, so Matt, I always like to know, on the partial height wall options, with the kick to the roof option, how do you accommodate the vertical deflection? I, I don't have a good answer to that. Daniel, you got a, a suggested answer to that? On the kick to roof, how do you handle deflection? Uh, no, there's not There's not an answer that can be defended flawlessly. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, we, we showed a lot of examples and, and some ways to make it work, but there, the, if you don't run all the way up the top and you run that diagonal kicker in there, um, if you get vertical movement, especially at a roof, because those those tend to have more movement, then you're going to get horizontal movement at the top of the wall. Now, one thing is if you've got something like I've got above me here, a lay-in acoustical tile, there is they, they can accommodate a little bit of movement of the wall without anything cracking. But let's say you've got a hard lid, a, a, a finished gypsum board ceiling, then that that's not going to accommodate the movement as well. I did see a structural investigation of a building collapse and even though these are non-load bearing partitions it was a, a massive snow load the part that did have full height walls under it did not collapse and the part where they had pulled the walls out it did collapse because even though these are non-structural they ended up carrying a little bit of the weight of the roof okay so just a couple of comments here from also um you may want to don confirm the requirements for the handrail and grab bars which are required by ibc to support 250 pound pull in every direction at any location. That's quite yes. a extensive comment. <laughs> no, no, that's that that's that is a requirement of the building code. When you put the, there's a lot of things that you attach to the walls, and uh, you, you you see the grab bars, you see uh, chair rails, you see wainscots, but the grab bars are the ones that have that point load requirement. So it and I've I've seen it in uh, in um, uh, uh, certain types of hospitals where they may be expecting uh, more forces on that. They the the owner may specify higher loads. I've I've seen uh, up to to 300 to 500 pounds point loads on these things, and that's in any direction. So up, down, sideways, and sometimes there's prying actions on these things. I've I've seen uh, some of the 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 seats in a a shower, and again that's going through tile. But a lot of times your stud thickness may have to be even thicker. For attaching those chairs that you'll have in a shower, um, 
so there's some ADA issues there as well. But uh, but yeah, there's the 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 when you have those high point loads, and there are accessories that are specifically made to go in the walls to support those things. But you can't just be screwing the gypsum board. And sometimes you just if if you're using a non-structural stud, you may have to use a lot of connectors to that stud to be able to get the shear and pull out that's required from that uh, from the, that attachment. Um, and then last comment here uh, for the composite walls. I want to ask if you remember Pat Ford writing any tech notes for the board fastened to the track a couple of years ago. Yes, is there it? is a, a policy letter on that that uh, SFIA has. And uh, if basically what I say is you have to look at the individual oh. manufacturer's um, instructions. So some manufacturers specifically say you have to make the attachment to that top track. Um, there may I, I, I've seen some data. I don't know if it's been published yet, but there's at least one manufacturer that has uh, composite tables where that attachment is not made. So read the manufacturer's data. Daniel, you were starting to say something. Yep, I was about to say exactly what you said. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> So that concludes our questions. Um, any last minute remarks from you or Daniel? Not from Don. Nope, I'm good. Well, thank you so much, Don and Daniel, for this presentation. We appreciate it. Thank you to all the attendees who stayed with us all this time. And then if you have more questions, you can email Don and Daniel. You see their contact information there and also on the slide deck. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>